name is Tara Cahiz Anderson. I work in the workforce department and I am the one of the co-chairs for the um, for the IAC committee and along with Keila Searcy and within the IAC, we, which is the Institutional Affairs Council, is the Go Red um, event or the Go Red at Southwest. And so we thank you and welcome you all for um, joining us on today. This is our first installment of our Lunch and Learn series. So I hope that you have some good, healthy food that you're sitting at your desk and that you're eating right now. And so with our Go Red um, campaign that we have going on, that is funding in part by our healthcare providers, which are Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Tennessee, and also Cigna. So we are excited to have them support our efforts in getting healthy and um, sharing information with our uh, faculty, staff, colleagues, and our students. Hopefully we have some students that are joining us today. And also um, what we will want to make sure that you understand and know that we have some wonderful faculty members here that are excited to share some information with you. And we have with us um, of our emer emergency medical services department, we have assistant professor Rachel Trigg. And with our nursing department, we have interim department chair Marlon Gibson, who will provide um, information to you on heart attack and stroke. We do want to highlight and make sure that you know they are medical licensed medical professionals. However, they are not your medical doctor. They are not your primary care physicians. So in any questions that you have, we will ask for you to direct those to the chat, but also know that they are always going to direct you back to your primary care physician for those follow up questions and those more specific questions that you may have. And also we want to just as Diana said that the uh, the uh, lunch and learn session today is going to be recorded. So by you staying on the link here with us, that means that you are consenting to the recording. We are going to ask that if you have your camera on, that you do turn it off at this time because Marlon and um, Rachel have a, a video, a presentation that they're going to share and that will allow it to uh, for it to be viewed on the entire screen. So if you have your camera on, we ask that you uh, turn that off. And then also we ask that you remain muted while they are speaking. We will have just a little bit of time at the end of the um, of the lunch and learn for a few questions. So again, if you already know what those are as they pop up, we will be watching that. You can type those in the chat and hopefully we'll have time to address those. We want to make sure that we do hold ourselves to the uh, the 30 to 45 minute time frame that we do have. So with that being said, the floor is now yours, Marlon and Rachel. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We're both glad to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm Marlon. <clears throat> and I'm Rachel or Shelly, depending on where I am, but yeah. Right. And I will start things off today by um, uh, presenting you with some information about heart attack, heart disease. So first off, we're going to, um, I'm going to show a video, a little short video about heart attacks and to get things started. So. It started out like a totally normal day. Okay, move objection deadline to the third line after survey. Oh, honey. For, for when you always use the breakfast star. What are you doing down there? Did you finish your breakfast? Ow. Whew. Don't hit your brother. <laughs> I mean, you have to eat something. Here. Okay, five minutes to carpool. Where's my coffee? Mm. You okay, Mom? Oh, I'm fine. Sandwich orders. What do you want? Almond butter and jelly. Spaghetti. Oh, you sure you're okay? I'm fine, sweetie. I am so late. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Uh, hey, honey. Hmm. You okay? Huh? Yeah, I'm fine. You sure? Oh, yeah. Here. Acai, my favorite. Mm. See you guys later. Okay. Where are your shoes? Put your shoes back on, please. You know, go help your sister. We're going in three minutes. Oh my God, what am I doing? I forgot to cut off the crust. Voila, shoes on, potty if you need it. Honey, get your sister. Okay, get your shoes. Nobody move. I'm getting a dustpan. Oh. Mom, mm. I think you're having a heart attack. Honey, do I look like the type of person who has a heart attack? I'm totally fine. Don't forget to wear the high socks with the shin guards. Forget about the shin guards, Mom. 
Come on, Mrs. Underdog is not going to wait. to bother you. <laughs> I think I might be having a little heart attack. <laughs> Nothing really, just some nausea, tightening of the jaw, dizziness, shortness of breath, muscle pain, achiness, this terrible pressure in my chest. Oh, really? They can be here in how long? <gasps> Two minutes. Can you make it ten? I thought I had gas. Turns out, I was having a heart attack. Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. So now I take care of my heart, and I tell the women in my life to do the same. Sounds great, by the way. That's nice, sweetie, but that's not my heart. That is. Make it your mission to save your life and the lives of the women you love. Find out more from the American Heart Association at GoRedForWomen.org. OK, so that was a, a brief uh, video um, featuring Elizabeth Banks who shared some information about heart attacks uh, using a little bit of humor. And now I'm going to uh, provide you with a uh, um, little bit more information about heart attacks with this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Right, so heart attacks, knowing makes the difference. And, um, and by knowing, you can uh, get a person help, knowing the signs and symptoms, um, you can get a person help as quick as possible. The quicker a person gets help, the better the outcomes associated with uh, a heart attack. So uh, heart disease is the number one cause of death in the United States. Nearly 700,000 Americans die each year because of heart disease. Heart attacks can be one of the results of heart disease. And the Go Red campaign is here to provide you with information to help you stay healthy and avoid experiencing a heart attack, or at the very least, increase your chances of recovering from one if you do have one. Heart attacks occur when there is an inadequate uh, blood flow to areas of the heart. The impaired blood flow can be a result of coronary artery disease, um, which involves narrow blood vessels in the heart, or it could be the result of spasms, which are contractions of those blood vessels, which prevent blood from getting to where it needs to go. Um, heart attacks are frequent occurrences in individuals in our communities. There are more than 800,000 people every year who have a heart attack. That's about once every 40 seconds. Uh, Within the time I do this video, there will probably, there will be at least about 20 people who will have a heart attack. Of those 800,000, 600,000 of those will have a heart attack for the very first time. And the other 200,000 will be uh, people who have had previous heart attacks at some point. When a heart attack happens, get help quick because time is tissue and the quicker a person gets help, the better the outcomes. A heart attack is often accompanied by certain signs and symptoms. As the video showed with Elizabeth Banks, um, she had chest pain, she had some nausea, she was tired, she was uh, had some lightheadedness. All of those things are associated with, with heart attacks. Um, they may be considered some of the typical signs and symptoms that you may see, especially the chest pain, jaw pain, shoulder pain, and sweating. But there are also some atypical signs, which are in general more associated with women who are having a heart attack. And those atypical symptoms include things like the tiredness, the nausea and vomiting, and even uh, an elevated level of shortness of breath. What can be done to reduce the likelihood of having a heart attack? Many people ask that question. And the best answer is to reduce the number of risk factors that you have that may lead to a heart attack. Risk factors can be um, categorized or identified as either being modifiable or non-modifiable. 
Our focus is mainly on the modifiable risk factors because they are uh, because those are things that we have some level of control over. The non-modifiable risk factors we can't do anything about. You know, we're basically born with those factors, or we age into those factors. Uh, modifiable risk fa factors include things like smoking. You should smoking. Uh, if you smoke, you should stop smoking. If you don't smoke, don't start. Uh, things like high blood pressure uh, is considered a modifiable risk factor. If you have high blood pressure, do what it takes to keep that blood pressure under control, uh, whether those are lifestyle changes or, or taking your medications as prescribed. Some of the non-modifiable risk factors, as I said, those are things that can't be changed, like a person's age. Even though heart attacks can occur at any age, the older a person, uh, as a person ages, the more risk they are, uh, they are at of, um, of having a heart attack. Um, genetics, if a person has a family history of heart disease, uh, they are at increased risk and they cannot change that factor. Uh, men, even though, as mentioned in Elizabeth Banks' video, heart disease is the leading cause of death in women. It is also the leading cause of death in men. It's also the leading cause of death in African Americans. It's the leading cause of death in white or Caucasian Americans. It's the leading cause of death across many, many dem demographics. It's the leading cause of death overall in the United States. Um, and we can't change those factors. We can't change our age. We can't change our gender. We can't change our, our race. Um, other uh, lifestyles may play a major role. Uh, our lifestyles may play a, a major role in our health. Eating right, getting plenty of exercise, controlling our weight, all go a long way towards healthy living. Those are some of the things that we can do to maybe prevent the onset of a heart attack. If you have a heart attack, after getting help, the next step is getting it diagnosed. There are both invasive and non-invasive ways for doctors to diagnose a heart attack. You know, there are different types of heart attacks. As seen in the video, the heart attack that Elizabeth uh, Banks had, it was one where she was able to continue doing some of her normal daily activities, but there are heart attacks that occur that can incapac incapacitate a person immediately. Um, we want to get those people help as soon as possible by getting them to an emergency department. And once they're at the uh, emergency department, um, they can be diagnosed using uh, invasive or non-invasive techniques. A couple of non-invasive techniques are things like those EKGs that you may have seen in the past where they stick some uh, little tabs on your chest and get a tracing of your heart waves uh, or even a chest x-ray could be non-invasive. Invasive measures involve poking and prodding, things like drawing your blood and maybe even doing a cardiac catheterization where they thread a catheter through a heart vessel to access a heart vessel. Um, after finding out what type of heart attack appropriate treatment follows, the number one concern would be to restore adequate blood flow to the heart. Medications will be used to support recovery and improve health. So restoration of that blood flow will impede or stop the onset of uh, scar tissue or even death of heart tissue that occurs when that blood uh, flow has been interrupted. So these, as you can see, medication therapy includes things like pain control for the pain associated with the heart attack, oxygen therapy to help supplement the amount of oxygen that gets, uh, that is delivered to, to your heart, uh, aspirin, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. And these are things that you would discuss with your doctor that you and your provider would uh, determine the best treatment for you. Um, recovery will involve cardiac rehab, which includes the necessary lifestyle uh, measures that support heart health. Those things like eating healthier, not smoking, managing your stress, and uh, taking your medications as prescribed. 
Um, as stated previously, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. Although there are slight variations from one population group to another, its impact is felt broadly. It is the leading cause of death in men and women in most races and ethnicities. Know the signs and symptoms and get help as soon as possible because time is tissue. So that's that's all I have for heart attacks right now. I am going to turn it over to Shelly, who will talk to you about strokes. So let me turn this over to Shelly. Hey guys, so we're gonna talk about stroke and I too am gonna to start my presentation off with a video. Quiet, please. Wait a sec. I'll take one. Oh yeah, all right, all good. Take care, way to go. Nice, bring it on. Gotcha, I'm here for you. Oh no, please, please, please. I'm waiting, interesting, not buying it, not fair. That's it, this conversation is over. Oh, brother. Body language can tell you all sorts of things. I'm having a stroke. I'm having a stroke. Know the sudden signs. Learn fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time. Time to call 911 immediately. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Learn the body language, the sudden signs, and spot a stroke fast. All right, you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, so first I'm going to start with some statistics about stroke. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S. Going to give you guys some statistics. It is the leading cause of disability. and can happen at any age in any time. It is the third cause of death in women. Stroke kills more women than men. African-American women have a higher prevalence of stroke. And one in five women will have a stroke. I'm going to repeat that, you guys. One in five women will have a stroke. So what is a stroke? Blood vessel that carries oxygen to the brain is either blocked by a clot or the vessel burst. So just like with a heart attack, you can develop a clot, a plaque can build up in the artery and a clot can develop and cause you to have a stroke. That's called an ischemic stroke. Or you can have a vessel that ruptures. Long term elevated blood pressure weakens the arteries in the brain and one of those vessels can rupture. So how to spot a stroke? Think fast, F-A-S-T, just like you saw in the video. Facial drooping. That woman was screaming out, I'm having a stroke. In her head, somebody help me, I'm having a stroke. Is the smile uneven when you ask them to smile at you? Is the face numb? A is for arm weakness. Ask them to raise both their arms. If one arm drifts downwards, I'm concerned that patient's having, or the victim's having a stroke. Is their arm numb? Are they experiencing speech difficulty? Is their speech slurred? Do they have trouble speaking or forming words? And then T is time. Time means to call 911. Even if the symptoms go away and they don't want you to call, go and call 911. Other stroke symptoms, things you might see. Guys, the victim may be confused, trouble understanding what you're telling them, trouble seeing either one eye, both eyes, trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance. They may appear to be intoxicated. Lack of coordination, one-sided weakness. That means one side of the body is weak. They may have difficulty swallowing. They may have a severe headache with no known cause. Some other subtle things, fatigue, nausea and vomiting as well. What you need to do if you think someone's having a stroke, again, call 911 immediately. Guys, you need to look at your watch. EMS providers are going to want to know, as well as the doctor at the hospital, they want to know when did they start to exhibit symptoms and signs of a stroke. So if you think about it, check your watch. It may be possible that they get what's called TPA, that's a clot buster that can go and break up that clot if it's within a certain, certain time frame. They can also have what's called endovascular treatment. 
where the doctor can go in and surgically remove that clot, that's also within a certain time frame. And I'd give you those time frames, except, you know, research, sometimes it changes. Or they could go in and repair the aneurysm if there's bleeding in the brain. It's very important, um, you guys, that you do not give anyone that you suspect is having a stroke anything to eat or drink. I cringed one time. Somebody told me that um, they had a neighbor that was having a stroke, and so they gave them aspirin. Do not give them aspirin. If they're having bleeding in the brain, that aspirin is going to make them bleed worse, and that's going to be uh, more detrimental to the person. So don't give them anything to eat or drink. All right, there's something called a warning stroke, or, you know, grandma and grandpa, you may have heard it called a, quote, mini stroke. It's called a transient ischemic attack. Someone will exhibit the same signs and symptoms as a full, full, full blown stroke, but it only lasts a few minutes, about 24 hours. We tend to blow it off, not important. Oh my goodness, what was that? Guys, that's an emergency. A TIA, transient ischemic attack, occurs before about 15% of full blown strokes. That's 15, one five, and is usually associated with additional TIAs or other cardiovascular problems. The effects of a stroke and treatment, it is going to de depend uh, widely on the location of the stroke and the extent of the brain tissue affected. The victim, the patient, you guys, we call them patients, right, Marlon, because we're nurses and paramedics. Um, they may need speech therapy to learn how to speak again, um, physical therapy, learn how to walk, use their arms and legs. Occupational therapy, I'm talking about learning how to, to, to feed themselves. How do I get this fork to my mouth? So it depends widely the portion of the brain and the extent of the tissue that's affected. Some risk factors. OK, so a lot of these are going to be um, same thing as for a heart attack, high blood pressure. Did you guys know that American Heart Association, American Heart Association, it's been just within the last few years, have made a statement that a normal blood pressure is below 120 over 80, 120 over 80. An elevated pressure is when the top number is 120 to 129 and the bottom number is 80. And high blood pressure stage one is this top number 130 to 139. Didn't used to be considered that 130 was considered high blood pressure. Quick backstory, you guys, that top number, that is the contraction of the ventricles. As, as, as they contract, and then the bottom number is how much pressure is always present in your heart. So a high bottom number can be just as dangerous as that high top number. There's a stage two high blood pressure and there's a hypertensive crisis as well. So smoking, um, nicotine and carbon monoxide in smoke damages your cardiovascular system. And it also smoking along with the use of birth control pills increases risk of stroke. Risk of stroke more than doubles um, the risk for stroke. And of course, the number of daily cigarettes makes a difference, but any type of smoking, as, as we all know, you know, is not is not good for you. Diabetes. Okay. People with untreated diabetes accumulate too much glucose in their blood, and over time, it results in fatty deposits or clots in the blood vessels. Diabetes affects one quarter of Americans 65 and over. Diet. Diet high in saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, we're talking about that good Southern food that we all like so much, um, is not good for us. Diabetes high, uh, sorry, diets high in sodium can also increase blood pressure. Diets high in sugar. Diets high in calories lead to obesity. American Heart Association suggests that diets containing five or more servings of fruit and vegetables per day may reduce your risk of stroke. Physical inactivity. Physical inactivity increases risk of stroke, heart disease, overweight, obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. Aim for being active at least 150, 150 minutes a week. That's not attainable. You guys break it up into little sessions. Just move more and sit less. Take the elevator instead of, take, no, don't do that. Take the <laughs> stairs instead of the elevator. And if it's a safe location, park a little further away and get your steps in that way as well. Talked about um, obesity. So 
again, American Heart Association, which is where I, I pulled this information from. And uh, side note, you guys, there's so much we're not discussing that is just full of information, aha.org to visit that at your leisure. Losing as little as five to 10 pounds can make a significant difference in your risk. We talked about high cholesterol, okay? That can build up and cause plaque to build up in your, in your arteries. Something called carotid artery disease. Carotid arteries become narrowed by fat deposits. The plaque builds up in the artery and can become blocked by a blood clot, causing a stroke. And peripheral artery disease. The peripheral arteries are the blood vessels that carry blood to your leg and arm muscles. Plaque can build up there as well. Those with PAD have an increased risk of carotid artery disease, which will increase the risk of stroke. Atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation. So you have a normal pacemaker to your heart, and it's in the top right section, and it fires. Your heart is electrical system, and it sends impulses down through, so your heart pumps like it's supposed to. The top portion pumps, and then the bottom portion. Love double. Okay. So what happens is that normal pacemaker in the heart sends impulses when it's not supposed to. That's the right atrium, so that atria contract. And then the ventricles are like, OK, it's time for me to contract, so I'm going to contract. So it becomes this, this irregular heart rhythm. Blood can tend to pool in that situation and, and form a clot, and that clot can travel to the brain. OK, so sickle cell disease um, prevalent in African-American community, Hispanic community. Your sickle cell disease, you have red blood cells, and they're normally disc shaped. They are the oxygen carriers throughout your throughout your uh, system in the bloodstream. What happens is they become sickle shaped, so they're very poor oxygen carriers. They tend to clump up, bind to blood vessel walls, which can block arteries and cause a stroke. You can't. Uh, this is a genetic, okay? But the highest risk of stroke caused by Sickle cell disease occurs during childhood. All right, some life changes going to be pretty much what Marlon talked to you guys about. Don't smoke or vape. Guys, avoid secondhand smoke. Eat healthy. Read the labels on packaged meals. And I'm, I'm guilty about this. If you turn over a packaged meal and you can't pronounce any of the ingredients, sometimes I still eat it. You too, Marlon, right? All the time. Yeah, all the time. But maybe that's not stuff that's good for us. So we want to read labels and eat healthy. You can use the five, uh, food diary to help you keep track of what you're eating. Keep a healthy weight. Um, limit alcohol intake. Get adequate sleep. So I have to share with you all. I'm sure you've seen this meme and I'm going to mess it up. But it says something about the things that I dreaded as a child have become my adult goals. Right? I want to stay at home. I want to go to my room and I want to take a nap. You guys, sleeping is when your body restores itself. And AHA suggests six, seven to nine hours per night per adult. Um, reduce stress. Reduce stress. Find ways to reduce your stress. Get your red, regular medical checkups. Sometimes we avoid medical checkups because we might be concerned about something and we don't want to know the answer because we're scared. So I tell my students the same thing every semester at the beginning. Time is going to pass you by no matter what. And the end of that semester is going to come make that time count so whatever's going on you guys get it checked because time's going to move on and maybe you can catch something early take your medications as directed know your blood pressure know your blood pressure um, get regular physical activity gradually increase it check with your doctor before you start um, a new activity again short on time break into smaller sessions and set goals for yourself set attainable goals there's i've seen things that um it's you know from couch to 5k in so many weeks so set you some obtainable goals and um, um just you know take care of yourself and that's going to be it for my section terica Yes, I am here. Thank you so much, Marlon and Rachel, for um, that informative information. We do have one question in the chat, and that question is, how can you tell the difference between a heart attack and a panic or anxiety attack? So if one of you can take that and provide that insight, we'll greatly appreciate it. Yeah. 
that's why it's important to seek out um, help when when you're experiencing uh, something like that. An anxiety attack could present itself with some shortness of breath. Um, it could uh, present. It, you you may even have some uh, pains associated with that with that uh, shortness with the anxiety attack. But um, to to know for certain, you know, you may have to go um, go to an emergency department or call 911 and go get yourself checked out. Uh, it, you know, you, you don't want to take a chance with your health. If you, if you have a history of uh, panic attacks, uh, that's one thing, and the likelihood may be that you're having that panic attack, but the advice that I would always give is to always know for certain and go get checked out, go to an emergency department and get yourself checked out. Right, yeah. right. I agree. Yeah, get checked. If anyone else had, would have any additional questions at this time, you can place them in the chat right at the moment. That was the only question that we had. Um, we do have uh, a thank you in the chat stating that this information was very helpful. I can say I really enjoyed the videos because it put it into perspective. Uh, because how often, um, especially with the first video, are we that person that we're trying to get everything done and keep things going and we are not taking that moment to realize what our body is telling us. And I believe one of my takeaways from the information that you have shared is to listen to your body. And I thank you all for the information that you all have shared today. Um, if there are no other questions, then um, Diana, do you have anything that you would like to add today? No, not at all. That was a fabulous presentation. Thank you for all the information. I learned quite a bit. And again, for anyone who would like to see the presentation again or who was not available to attend today, we're going to uh, go ahead and package up the presentation and um, put it on YouTube. So we'll we'll send that link in our next communications about our upcoming um Go Red activity planned for October. So, Diana, Terica, so Marla and I have been practicing something. Come on, Marla. You, you <laughs> nailed it. Can you, can you see it? We yeah. can see it. We thought it looked like a squished tomato, but we. <laughs> yeah, we figured everybody would know what we're doing. Yeah, that's what we're trying. <laughs> Get the picture. You got it. Be well, heart smart and go red at Southwest also. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Thank and you. for Thank anyone you. who is looking to still get engaged with the STEP challenge, we welcome you to do so. In the um, communication that um, Diana will send out, there will be a link where you can sign up to do so. So we encourage you to be heart healthy and to um, get to stepping. You know, with uh, the information that Marlon and Rachel shared, one of the things they said that you could do to help yourself is to get moving. So whether or not that is a five minute walk or 10 minute or a 30 minute walk, get to moving to help your heart. So that is all that we have for you today. We again, just wanna thank you for joining us for our first installment of our Lunch and Learn. You can look forward to hearing from us again on next month on our next installment. Everyone have a wonderful Tuesday. Thank you.